Council for just today until it goes upon the variety testing program here at the University of Kentucky for fall testing. Ray? Let's welcome Ray. Thank you, Chris. And I just got the box for your tickets. I'm going to hand this out at the end of the meeting. And don't let me forget, because I've got $100 in my pocket, and it'd be a pity if I walked home with that and had to use it myself. So remind me at the end, I'll just come down the aisle and, and pick up these tickets. And it's probably already been acknowledged, but I just want to make sure that we thank Dr. Lacefield for donating these books, $29 value that everybody should have. There's a few left in the back if you didn't get one yet. Thank you, Gary. Yeah. And the author would be glad to sign your book if you would like it to at the end. Okay, so um, Gary's given a great overview of the history, and we talked a little bit about varieties already. Um, so with any forage, you obviously want to pick the best, or our encouragement is to pick the best variety possible. So I want to go into a bit of detail in a few minutes about how you go about doing that. Here's an um, aerial view of our forage variety testing program that um, Gene Olson is the coordinator. Um, I might claim a little bit of credit, but, but Gene's the one that does all the work. Um, excellent. Actually, uh, probably the largest forage testing program in the U.S. I know it's in the top three. Um, we test clovers, we test grasses, but when we get into something like tall fescue, when we get into something like um, the rye grasses, any, any forage really, one of our main things is does it survive? We also measure yield, we also have tests for grazing tolerance, uh, but you don't want to end up with a stand like that one um, just to the right of the middle of that slide. But before I talk about varieties, we can't overemphasize enough making sure that your fertility is right. This is the soil test from a field a few years ago um, that had been cut for hay for about 10 years and very little nutrients had been added back on. And they couldn't figure out why they couldn't get a good stand. They were trying to replant the stand. Their phosphorus was low. Their potassium was very low. Um, their pH wasn't terrible to put a grass in. would have been important to get it up for clover. But you want the phosphorus to be 30 or more. 60 is ideal. You want the potassium to be 200 or more. Um, 250 is better. Um, so make sure the soil test is there, particularly if you're going to go and start a new, try to get a new stand started. So tall fescue. Now Gary gave this list of varieties. Um, there's actually one that's not here. I'm not just going to read all of these, but I want to make a point that novel tall fescue, as Gary talked about, it has a novel or beneficial endophyte. It also is a, just a genetic variety. So they're all going to have two names. Baroptima is the name of the actual fescue variety, plus E34 is the endophyte. Um, Max-Q the same way. Some of us just say Max-Q and think that's a variety, but really we need to say the name of the variety like Jessup Max-Q, Lacefield Max-Q2. Um, so if someone tells you that a particular variety is a novel endophyte, it's got to have two names. And there's some companies that have been selling varieties and saying or alluding that they're a novel endophyte when they're really just an endophyte free. So make sure you check that. If the price seems too good to be true, to be a novel endophyte, it probably is not one. Because a lot of technology goes into the novel endophytes, and since the endophyte doesn't survive that long in the seed, they've got to pr um, produce a fresh seed crop every year. Now to get to the info that I'm going to show you, whether it's tall fescue variety testing or any variety testing, you first go to our forage website. Chris has already mentioned. Um, just Google UKY forages or UK forages or KY forages. Just make sure you get those two things in there. You get to our website. You've got upcoming events. You've got our forage news that you can sign up for. Uh, but if you click here on variety trials, then that'll take you to this variety trial page. Um, and you've got all of the most recent, um, here's the 2019 variety trials. Um, I'm going to point out a couple of these, but let me, let me go ahead and move to the tall fescue. So we went ahead and put in your proceedings the tall fescue um, variety 
report, and we've also tested some of the brome grasses in that same report. So it's on page 31. And so every one of the forages that we test, we have an individual report like this. And this individual report is going to give the, all the tests that are currently in the ground. So they're not, it's not going to tell you what was in the ground 10 years ago. It's going to tell you what was in the ground. And I'll tell you in a minute why that's important to make that distinction. Uh, but let me move in this report so you want to know what tall fescue to plant. So um, we go to table 8 if you want to follow along um, in, in what's in your proceedings. And you've got a whole lot of numbers there. Uh, you've got the names of the varieties. You've got whether it's a novel or endophyte free, um, toxic in, in the case of Kentucky 31. You've got how good a seedling vigor it had when we planted it. You've got a stage of maturity at cutting to tell you whether it's an early or late maturing type. Um, you've got how well the stand has survived. And you've got the yield in tons per acre. So a lot of information. But remember, don't just flip to one of these tables and say, oh, um, so that's the varieties I need to plant. Those top three or something like that, because that's just one test. The other thing to notice, and I think I've actually got it highlighted over here, is all of the top five in this test, statistically, that little asterisk means that statistically um, there's no difference between them. Um, so again, take a look at that when you're trying to decide what variety. Don't just say, well, um, one is in the top numerical order, um, another one's further down. Um, look at how that fits. So you go to another table. Um, here's the test in Quicksand, Kentucky. Um, the order that the varieties, the yield was a little bit different than before. But again, all of those novel varieties there um, that, that were on the previous trial, they're all statistically the same. Um, so um, this, again, I, I mentioned was in quicksand. This is actually a three-year-old test. You're going to get better data from a test that's been there several years because most of you that want to plant fescue want to have good long-term survival. So more information. So you can flip through the individual trials, and that gives you good information. That gives the kind of tonnage you can expect, the maturity. Um, but since the varieties kind of flip around from year to year, what we've done and put together, not just for fescue, uh, but for all of the forages we test, is a long-term summary. Um, so we also put the, the back page of the fescue report is the long-term summary for fescue. But in your proceedings, we've got the whole long-term summary page um, three, it looks like. Uh, so this is all the forages that we've tested, and the data in here is how well they've done over the last about 15 years. So this is going to give you even more information than that individual report. And we've got a listing of everything here from clover, alfalfa yield, fescue, orchard grass, down here to the warm season annuals, even down here to our grazing tests and how well things have held up under grazing. Okay, so... Um, this is your eye, if you, uh, te your test to see if you need eyeglasses, see who can read that chart. I'm going to show a blow-up version in a minute. But a huge chart because we've tested a bunch of fescues over the years. Um, but let me, let me take that a little bit larger. Okay, here's just a part of that really big chart. So that really big chart I showed you before, uh, this is not even the whole thing that's in your publication. Um, every one of the columns represents a different test at a different location. Uh, and then we've got a summary on the side. So let me explain that. So here's the middle of that chart. Um, we've got whether it's a novel, endophyte free. Um, we've got these columns. We've got the, the summary over here on the side. And you see numbers that you say, what does that mean? That's not tons per acre. Um, to summarize it, we converted it into how well it's done compared to the rest of the varieties in the test. So the long and the short is you want to say, I want something that's, that's average or at least are, are better than average. So 100 is average, better than 100 is better than average. Um, so let me explain that. So Kentucky 31, Lacefield Max Q2, Martin 2 Protec, 
Uh, they're all above 100, uh, 100%, meaning better than average in the test that they've been in. I'm Kentucky 31. We've had in all of our tests over those years, so it's been in 21 tests. Lacefield, we've had in 11 tests. The more tests it's been in, the more confident you can be of that data. Martin II is a good variety. We've only had it in three tests. So, um, again, I feel confident in recommending it, but the more tests that it's in, the more confident you can be it's going to do well over time. Um, down here, for example, Texoma, Max-Q2, we've only had in one test so far. So I'm, I feel like it's a good variety for our environment, um, but we don't even put the... the uh, long-term average because we want to get a little bit more data before we feel confident um, to put that in there. Uh, the Tower Protec is a novel endophyte variety. Uh, it's one that's very palatable. Um, so that's a real good attribute. Animals like it. Um, but it doesn't have quite the survival characteristics of some of the other ones. So if you're okay with a little shorter-term stand, then it would be a very good choice. Uh, but you see that the, the, the survival over time is, or the, the yield over time is 94. So let me just make a couple of comments. My main point with this slide is that all of these varieties have done well. Um, the only exception, the Tower 2 Protec, um, has not been up above 100%, uh, but it is a very palatable one. So you would, you would have to realize it's not going to last as long, but they're, they're going to really like it. So the Bar Optima is a soft leaf type, uh, typically more desired by the animals, uh, but you've got to be all the more careful they don't eat it into the ground. Um, Estancia developed in Arkansas, Missouri. Um, we've had it in a number of tests. Um, Gary's already mentioned the Jessup Max-Q, the first novel variety. Texoma developed in central Oklahoma. So we feel quite confident it's got improved drought tolerance, so we'd like to get more tests in Kentucky. Lacefield Max-Q2 was developed in Kentucky by Tim Phillips, so we feel very confident about its adaptability. Um, the Martin II Protec we've tested extensively has done well. So people keep asking, like Gary said, what variety do I plant? Um, we really have many good choices. Um, and so we, we, we don't, you know, some things we can tell you to plant certified Kenland Red Clover, and that's going to do better than a lot of the other ones. With the novel fescues, having that novel endophyte in there, uh, many of them are doing very well. Um, if you want to know more about um, the novel fescues and how to, how to get a stand established, in the last few years we've been teaming up with the um, Tall Fescue Alliance program, and we've got workshops. They're actually in several states. Um, some of you may be closer to Spring Hill, Tennessee than you are to Lexington, so the Tennessee location is March 18th. Uh, here in Kentucky, we're March 19th in Lexington. Um, this actually is in the back. This flyer is in the back. You can sign up for that program. Um, we'll have a, a, a limited attendance, so if you're interested, make sure you sign up for that. Uh, I mentioned Forge News earlier. It comes out monthly. All you got to do is go into the website and sign up for that. We'll even mail you a copy. If you really want it mailed, you need to give me your address at the end. But anybody can go here and sign up. Um, Last thing I want to say, and I'm only going to show this slide, disc bind, uh, and I'm going to show this slide. This is, one, this is orchard grass, one year of cutting close, cutting down here under an inch versus leaving four inches of stubble, and we pretty well wiped out the stand. They say, oh, that's orchard grass. I know it won't handle close cutting. Um, Tom Keene did the same thing this past past three years on tall fescue and quicksand, he was getting the same results after three years with fescue, cutting it close, and you can scalp with a disc bind. So you might not get this kind of difference in one year with fescue like we did in orchard grass, but he's shown that in three years, he's just pulling that data together now, you can get that with fescue. So remember your management, not just choosing that particular variety. Chris, I think I just had 15 minutes, so I better, better stop. Yes.
Very good question. If you go to our grazing test, uh, not the summary report, that just shows which survived the best, but in the individual grazing test, like that 2019 tall fescue grazing test, we've actually got a rating of palatability based on which ones they like better at the first grazing. Um, we don't have a lot of good tests that show the different novel endophytes tested against each other um, for animal gain. Most of the tests have been testing a novel endophyte versus a endo, uh, Kentucky 31, showing much better gain, as Gary said. Um, the, um, but I'm, I'm very confident that weight gain is going to have very little difference between the different novels. I mentioned those two, that, that the palatability, the, the bar optima, um, the tower, um, if you put them in a stand and they have it side by side, they'll usually go toward those first, uh, which is a good thing. The negative thing is you've really got to watch it because those, the, they can tend to graze into the ground. Yeah. What's 32? Um, Kentucky 32 is an endophyte free variety. Some have talked about it as a novel endophyte. It's not. It's an average yielding endophyte free, so if that's what you want, um, good, they've had some pretty good seed prices, uh, but but don't be fooled in thinking it's a novel endophyte variety. All right, we're going to have to move on, but we're going to bring everybody back up.